we are going to celebrate um, the Paris bookseller with Miss Carrie Mayer. Hi, Carrie. Thanks Hi, for joining Sarah. us. Thank you for having me. The magic of Zoom. We were talking about this in the green room before. I know. It's such a pleasure and an amazing opportunity to have these, these opportunities with authors and all of you get to view from all over. The, I can't believe how many Michigan people. This is Thanks. awesome. Yeah. Well, hello, Michigan. Hello, Florida. <laughs> yes. Currently in St. Pete, my sister-in-law used to live there. It's beautiful. Well, tonight, everyone, Carrie has blessed us with her presence. Um, Carrie shines at bringing to life the true stories of influential women. In 2018, Carrie published The Kennedy Debutante, an enthralling love story about Kathleen Kennedy, JFK's sister, <laughs> the girl in white gloves, about the life of Grace <laughs> Kelly. Look at you all prepared. I, I just happen to have them sitting next to me. It's true. Crazy how that happens. Um, and now we have the Paris bookseller. Um, it actually came out last a week. week ago. Yes. Um, and it chronicles the, the story of Sylvia Beach, the American woman behind the much loved Paris bookstore, Shakespeare and Company, and her courageous triumph over censorship, big deal right now, while publishing James Joyce's classic novel, Ulysses. A former bookseller herself, Carrie was the first, sorry, she was first inspired by Beach's story while working at the Conservation Department of Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, preserving rare texts. The Paris bookseller is her love letter to bookstores, and who wouldn't want to write a love letter to bookstores? And to the women who fought to print the book that became one of the 20th century's most important pieces of literature. All right, I am going to start off. I have some wonderful questions for Carrie, and then we're going to open the floor to all of you wonderful viewers this evening. Feel free to drop any questions at any time in the chat, um, as well as that Q&A section, and I will be sure to get to them. Right. So, Carrie, I'm gonna let you talk now. <laughs> so um, why don't you um, start off and tell everyone about the Paris Bookseller and what a little bit about what it's about. So the Paris Bookseller is about the amazing American woman named Sylvia Beach. And I just want to say a, a word about my cover for a minute. The cover of this beautiful book is actually based on a painting. And because we're on Zoom and not in like, this is the magic of Zoom and you're in my living room, you can see that the painting, I actually have the painting that my wonderful uh, publisher Berkeley commissioned to, to become the cover of, of, the, of the novel. So we get to enjoy that while um, chatting this evening um and so so here is sylvia um on the cover she opened the original shakespeare and company bookstore in paris in 1919 and it quickly became the home of the lost generation writers. You know, all those famous writers of the 20s that you know, Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, F. Scott Fitzgerald, they all went there. And in some cases, and they, some of them used her um, store as their post office box in Paris. <laughs> um, so it truly was like a home. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, she also published the very first edition of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses. And there is James Joyce also on the cover of the book. <laughs> um, I just, I have to sit in front of part of it and that's where I'm sitting tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so James Joyce's novel, Ulysses was banned in this major obscenity trial in New York in 1921. And, uh, as a result, all the major publishers in New York and London pulled out their offers to publish it. But Sylvia, from her perch of, in Shakespeare and Company in Paris, offered to publish it. And um, the very first editions um, rolled off the presses and appeared in her store on February 2nd, um, 1922. So we are just on the eve of the 100th anniversary of her edition of Ulysses. Awesome. So what... Um... What kind of was the inspiration for you to write this story? So um, it's sort of interesting. I have been carrying Sylvia's story around with me since I was a college um, English major. You know, there I was, so half my life ago, more than half my life ago. So, you know, there I am, I'm, I'm an undergrad at UC Berkeley. I'm taking all the classes I can possibly take on um, 
you know, uh, early 20th century literature, especially um, this expat uh, moment in the 1920s in Paris. Um, and, you know, those wonderful, you know, used book bins, bargain books in front of, you know, college bookstores. I was, you know, trolling around those one day and um, I pulled a, a copy of Sylvia's own memoir out of one of those bins. It was called Shakespeare and Company. And I read the back and saw that it was about Paris in the 20s. And I thought, oh, I'm going to buy this. So I brought it home and I read it. And I was just like totally taken in by her story. And, you know, it's, I say this in my author's note, but, you know, it's a very slim little book considering what a huge life she led. Um, so I read it and I just, I was, I was entranced, but, you know, I was 20 years old. I kind of filed it away under good to know. Um, fast forward two plus decades. Um, I've written The Kennedy Debutante and The Girl in White Gloves. And it came time for me to think about what my next subject would be. And I really quickly homed in on Sylvia Beach because, and, you know, because of this his history I had with her. And it, it's sort of amazing to me that it took me so long to think of her as a subject considering how long I've known about her story, but I'm really glad that it did um, because I think as a first try at historical fiction, I would have been too scared to put words in the mouth of Ernest Hemingway and James Joyce and Ezra Pound. I had to practice with John F. Kennedy first because <laughs> AFK is, a, is an important small minor character in the Kennedy debutante. So I had to put words in his mouth first and then I could graduate to, um, to, uh, Hemingway <laughs> and Joyce. I love it. So um, obviously you, you had read um, Sylvia's uh, memoir, but was there any other research that you had to do when you were writing this book? Was there anything that maybe took you down a rabbit hole of discovery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have, you know, when I, when I really embarked on researching and writing this in earnest, I of course reread her memoir. There were, you know, numerous other nonfiction books um, that I either revisited that I had read before, like Ernest Hemingway's Immovable Feast. And uh, there's also a biography of Sylvia um, written by Noel Riley Fitch um, and, and many others. And there's a little, there's a select bibliography at the end of my book that anyone, if you want to keep living in this world, you can certainly look up any of those books. Um, but what I will say, I also got to go to Paris um, in the research of my, my, for the book, which maybe we can talk more about later. But to answer the second part of your question, one of the rabbit holes that I went down um, that was really like, it was a short, it was a small, a small rabbit warren, maybe we'll call it, um, but it was so interesting. So the obscenity trial of 1921 took place in New York um, and it took place at the Jefferson Market Courthouse in downtown Manhattan. So I wanted, in a very early iteration of this draft, which is wound up on the cutting room floor, there, was, there were some scenes set in New York. And I actually, so I wanted to actually describe the courthouse. Um, so I Googled it. And wouldn't you know it, but the courthouse has, in the 100 years since, become a library. It is now the Jefferson Market Library. Um, and, um, it's currently under, under renovation. I haven't been able to go see it myself, but isn't that amazing? And, and, and like, in addition to the obscenity trial of Ulysses, it, it saw numerous other really interesting um, uh, court cases in its days as a, as a courthouse. So that was, that was a, a cool rabbit hole to, to go down one day. Absolutely. Do you want to talk a little bit about that trip to Paris? Yeah, well, of course, <laughs> um, like you know, I, I, I'm gonna, so I'm actually, I'm gonna share my screen if I may, since we're talking about Paris, I've got some really fun slides. So, you know, here's Paris. Everyone can sort of take a breath and say, ah, uh, is that, can everyone see it now? This is uh, the, night, yeah. the night shot <laughs> of Paris. Um, and so I went to Paris and because I really wanted to just soak up, you know, th these are these are professional photos, right? That I'm showing you right now, and you know, it really does look like this. <laughs> um, if for those of you who have never been there or are just reminding yourself of how beautiful it is, and that's the Eiffel Tower, of course. And I like to say I took this picture that Paris is so beautiful that I could take this picture <laughs> with my iPhone. This is actually standing in, a, in one of the rooms of the Dorsey Museum. But so I'll just leave it there for a second. So 
you know, I got to go to Paris before the world shut down in the summer of 2019. And I knew that I wanted to stay in the neighborhood where Sylvia's Shakespeare and Company opened in 1919, which is, you know, really the heart of the, the left bank. Um, it's a heavily touristed area now. Um, and it was, it was really hard to find a place to stay. I also knew a really good friend of mine who lives in London was gonna come stay with me for part of the time. So I sort of wanted two bedrooms. So I'm on Airbnb, like getting depressed that there's nowhere for me to stay. And through the magical algorithm, you know, where they show you things that they think you should see, one of, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that they threw at me was something called James Joyce Flat. And I just thought, no, that can't be. And, it was. So I want, so the first picture of the, of the apartment on Airbnb are these two plaques, which I'm going to scroll through a few pictures right now. And we, we might be able to come back to some of them. Um, were, were these two um, plaques? I'm sorry. Don't be, they're beautiful even if they're Okay, <laughs> well, well, we'll come back to some of them. Where was this? I took this picture, but you can see it says James Joyce stayed here while he was writing Ulysses, and also the French poet Valerie Larbeau also lived here. Now, <laughs> I couldn't afford to stay at this flat. I basically, I wrote to the owner and I was like, I can't afford to stay there, but I'm writing this novel. Could I come see it one day? And anyway, he and I corresponded and long story short, he, he lowered his price for me and I got to stay. I know. That's and amazing. I know. So just a level set. Nobody knows exactly which apartment it is. It was in the building. The, the apartment belonged to Valerie Larbeau and, and he, as the French do, went to the seaside in the summers and Joyce and his family lived there in the summer of 1920, I'm sorry, yeah, 1921. And um, just to give you a, and so it was, it's, it's this building is sort of set back from the main road. If you imagine where, where we're standing now is where a gate is at the main road. And you, you go through this gate and you walk up this driveway, which empties into this uh, beautiful courtyard. <laughs> um, and so I got, I got to stay there and imagine what it would have been like to be James Joyce writing Ulysses. Um, and also what it would have been like to be Sylvia visiting him not just not just visiting Joyce during that summer, but also visiting Valerie Larbeau, who was um, a lifelong friend of hers. So this was a place, a building, a courtyard that Sylvia would have gone to numerous times in her life. So I just really, it was like just the best possible experience. And um, when I first got there, you can see that it was sort of had been rainy. And once the rain cleared, I was walking around and one block up the street, is another plaque on another building that says this was Ernest Hemingway's first apartment in Paris. So I was really in it. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I love it too. That's amazing. I, I mean, could it be anywhere meant to be really? It, it, it could not have. It really could not have. I feel really, really like privileged that I could, I had this experience. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to See, can I move you? I can't. Um, so in your experience in writing this, so this was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, how long did it take you to write the book? Were you still writing it during the pandemic or? Yeah, I did. You know, I, so I was in the early research stages pre-pandemic and um, sort of, I, I took a break from researching and writing to, to launch the, the girl in white gloves that you mentioned earlier. Um, and, and then I really, I really, I was, I was writing it and really rewriting it in earnest during that first big shutdown that we had. And you know, my daughter had to do remote school like everybody else. And at the time she was in third grade and that was really hard, but I have a long history, you know, from the days when she was a, um, in preschool. And I really only had a couple of hours at any given time to sit down and write, um, of writing in these short bursts. So I, that's just the way kind of, I do it. Um, so that served me well during the pandemic also. Yeah. I can imagine that that would be a, easy thing to jump back into, but also it was a pandemic. Yes. So do you feel, <laughs> did you, did you feel 
um, that that hindered you in any way in the writing process? Um, you know, writing has always kind of been my happy place and my escape from whatever it is that's going on in my life and in the world. I think I, I have a very active imagination and um, I think getting to escape into Paris in the 1920s was one of the greatest gifts during that, the, that initial lockdown, you know, that I could just kind of go there um, and, and be there. And, you know, I, I don't know how many other writers you've asked this question, but I know I, many writers and I have talked about this, like the actual, except for our kids being home all the time, the day-to-dayness of our lives didn't change that much because we already worked from home. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't like we stopped going to an office or something like that. Like we still just went downstairs, made coffee and went to another room. <laughs> um, That's fair. That's fair. So, so there's that. Yes. I think uh, the, the answer to that question vary across the board. Um, yeah. We've definitely had some authors that are like my creativity shut down. <laughs> I, yes. I couldn't think, but I think also like you had the opportunity to take that trip before the pandemic. So I'm sure that it was flowing. And I think that I truly, I think that if I hadn't started the book before the pandemic, it would have been much harder to get into it. But because I was kind of midstream when the pandemic hit, I think that enabled me to escape into it more easily. I think if I had, if I had had to start that process during the pandemic, that would have been much, much harder. Absolutely. I can uh, commiserate with having your children at home. <laughs> I have, I have my, mine are third and fourth now. So they were uh, younger then. They need yeah. a lot of attention, time and attention. They do. And I need to give it to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we talked about your research and we talked about um, writing these characters. What was it like in developing Sylvia as a character? Well, yeah, I mean, I I felt, I think like many writers of this sort of niche of historical called biographical fiction, where we're, where we're writing about somebody who did once walk planet earth, um, you know, we feel, and I feel this real um, need to be true to her essence, um, to really, to, and so to that end, you know, I reread her memoir, I read this biography, I read letters that she wrote and received, um, and, you know, really just tried to get a sense for how she thought about the world and, and kind of the, the kind of ways she used speech and stuff like that. But, so there's this tension though, between trying to do right by this person and also really uh, um, embracing the fact that it is fiction. <laughs> and yes. that my Sylvia Beach would is different than anyone else's Sylvia Beach would be. Um, you know, she my character who is named Sylvia Beach in, in the Paris bookseller is a character, and she is a she is on some level a figment of my imagination. And that's just kind of a both things are true kind of tension that, um, I don't know, I, I find that very inspiring and interesting to work in that, in that tension. Um, so, so that's, that's sort of how I do it. Um, so we, we're starting to get questions in. Oh, great. Yay. So I'd love to share one of those. Um, and I want to encourage everyone that's watching, please feel free to drop your questions and we'll get to those for sure. Um, So Laura Mason is asking, how do you come up with the ideas for your books and what is your next book going to be about? So, you know, I, I talked, I talked about how I came up with the idea for the Paris bookseller. You know, it it was something, it was a book that it was her book that I read 20 plus years ago. Um, And, you know, with my other it, ideas come from all kinds of places, you know, with the, with the Kennedy debutante, it came from a television show that I watched. Um, you know, so remember Downton Abbey, the, the Downton Abbey craze. Um, so 
there was a, and remember how like PBS was throwing everything on television that was related to, could possibly be related yeah. to Downton Abbey. So, so I watched one of those, um, it was a documentary series that came out of England. It was like called like the great manor houses of England and the Marquis yeah. estate. Yeah. The Marquis estate of that series was High Clear Castle where Downton Abbey was filmed, but they also did a one hour episode on Chatsworth house, which is, has for 400 years been the seat of the Dukes of Devonshire. So, you know, they're doing the whole 400 year history of the estate and they spend maybe two minutes talking about the fact that John F. Kennedy's younger sister, Kathleen, stood to inherit the house as the future duchess if she married the future duke who she was in love with, but that and he was in love with her, but that their romance was opposed by both of their families because she was a Catholic and he was a Protestant. And I thought, man there's a story there <laughs> and there was. So what moral of the story, watch more television, maybe documentary television. <laughs> um, and, you know, Grace Kelly came to me in, in a sort of similar way to Sylvia Beach. You know, she's always been on my radar. I'm not a particular royal watcher or anything, but my mom was a great Alfred Hitchcock fan. And so Rear Window and, um, and uh, like, um, dial in for murder and to catch a thief were part of my growing up. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, inspiration comes from everywhere. Um, and so I, I'm not going to talk too much about my next book because it's still really like in process, but I will tell you that unlike these three books, my first three historical novels, which really accidentally, I promise I didn't plan it this way, but are all about American women who kind of go to Europe and do interesting things, um, which was wonderful for my research process. <laughs> I um, can imagine. This, my, my, my fourth book will stay in the States, in Chicago, in the early 1970s. So totally different. And Chicago has most definitely changed since the 1970s. Yes, and, <laughs> but, but you know, I went to Chicago this summer. I stayed with my good friend, Renee Rosen, who wrote The Social Graces that came out last year. This is great. Um, and I had never been to Chicago. So honestly, it was just as exciting. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I know um, a coworker of mine is from there and she's watching. So I'm sure she can tell you it's definitely changed. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's an amazing city. So I'm glad you got to go and check it out. Yeah. Um, so what are you reading while are you, do you read while you write? What are you reading right now? Yeah. So, so I, I have sort of two categories of reading in my life. There is the reading I do with my eyeballs, which is almost <laughs> always, um, you're going to understand the distinction in a minute, which is almost always um, research or books I'm reading to blurb. So I, I'm even, and even though I enjoy both, both of those um, reading very much, in fact, I enjoy the research piece of my writing uh, career as much as I enjoy the writing portion. I love learning about people and places and times in history. I just love that. Um, uh, so that, but I would say that's all work reading and I am a painfully slow reader. So that just is like really a slow process for me. My, my pleasure reading is entirely audiobooks. So, um, so anything that I've read that's been actually published, I read through Libro FM. So Beautiful. I'm my local <laughs> independent bookstore. Um, and I have a couple of things that I've absolutely loved recently. Um, I'm currently, and I, I'm always listening to an audiobook. My dog and I um, go for long walks and I listen to audiobooks, and that's how I get a lot of my reading done, or I'm listening while I'm making dinner or folding laundry or whatever. Um, so, one of my favorites in the last year um, has been was The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Um, and it's a wonderful book, no matter how you decide to read it. But if you do listen to it as an audiobook, it's sort of extra special because he reads it <laughs> and he does an amazing job. Um, I, I admit I was a little skeptical. I was like, oh, Stephen, do you really want to do this? And, you know, within two minutes, I was like, oh, yes, 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 yes. He is just, I don't know if he has any theater background, but he's like a gifted, he's a gifted audiobook reader. Like he's, it's great. Um, so that's been one of my favorites. Um, another one of my favorites um, has been The Women of Chateau Lafayette by Stephanie Dre. Um, it's another great historical novel and it has three narrators and they actually gave three different actresses for each of the different parts. And that's a wonderful audiobook. 
it, again, a wonderful book, no matter how you read it, but it was it, uh, like a really fun audio book too. That's awesome. I'm just getting into audio books. Um, I, with the two little ones running around, it's kind of hard for yeah. you to sit and listen to an audio book, you know, um, but Libro FM, um, we actually are on there. And so if anybody is looking to get into audiobooks, um, go check out Libro FM. When you check out, you can actually um, support Schuler Books and Nicholas Books when you check out there um, versus using a competitor. Yeah, uh, no, definitely. And also, I will also say you can do children's books. My daughter and I have always done audiobooks um, together and there are great children's books on, on audio also. So you could, you could put it, I, we have them on in the car. I love it. Um, we have another question from Laura. Um, would you ever read for your own audiobooks? No. If not, <laughs> if not, who would you want to do them? Um, no. All, and all three of my books, my books have have audiobooks and they are excellent. Um, in fact, I just downloaded the Paris bookseller one today. Um, although I have heard snippets of it all, all along, and she is a wonderful reader. Um you know, they've all, I, I have been really blessed with three absolutely terrific readers. I, I could not have asked for anyone different or better for, for any of the three books. I'm just really, I feel, I do feel really lucky that um, a rising star of audiobooks did read The Kennedy Debutante. Her name is Julia Whalen. She's also a writer herself and she's won like awards for her, for her narration. She, she won a big, like the Audi award. It's like the audio Oscars. Um, for her reading of Educated, um, which was I, which I did listen to and was really tremendous. Um, so there's a whole world of like talent out there in in the world of audiobooks. But I would definitely never do it. I am not. I really enjoy extemporaneous speaking and talking to you guys. And I'm, I'm, in, you know, I'm very animated and I'm engaged. But I can't do the accents and you know all that stuff that uh, uh, an actual um, someone who's trained in voice work can do. Um, what authors inspire you? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, you know when I, this, in some ways, this question is easier to answer from earlier in my life, you know, so, um, F Scott Fitzgerald has always inspired me. I don't want to be like him, but I do think his, his career is fascinating and his writing is, fan, is beautiful. You know, the great Gatsby is a book I've read, um, many times throughout my life. In fact, I feel like I'm due for a rereading. <laughs> um, you know, another writer, um, a contemporary writer who I've read all of her novels and she's got one coming out and I, there are not many writers I can say this about. <laughs> um, and she has a new one coming this spring is Julia Glass, who wrote uh, Three Junes that won the National Book Award quite a, f a handful of years ago. I want to say at least 15 years ago, but I, I love her, 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 her writing. And I actually know her now. She lives not that far from me um, in Massachusetts, which is like such a cool thing. Um, you know, many moons ago, also when I was in college, I discovered this British writer named A.S. Byatt, who's um, many, I've read many, many of her novels and they were really important to me um, when I was sort of developing my skills as a writer. One of my, one of my earliest important novels that was uh, Little Women. I think that's that seems to be a theme among historical novelists. <laughs> um, and my friend Elise Hooper wrote The Other Alcott, you know, about um, uh, May, the painter in the family. So hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Um, what's, so you can't talk too much about what's next for you. No, I can't. But you know what I could talk about? I don't know if anyone's asked about the relationship between the current uh, Shakespeare and Company and um, and the original. Is that something that I could yeah, talk go about? for it? Absolutely. And I have slides for this also. Um, so I'm gonna. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna go back. I, I will narrate a few of these slides as I go back um, now. So this is actually, this is a slide of Sylvia Beach and James Joyce inside Shakespeare and Company. So this is like a little um, snippet of 
you know, what, what it would have been like to see the two of them in the store, you know, there he is with his eye patch on, you know, one of the things that was really incredible about his writing of Ulysses was he was doing it really as, I mean, he had so many health problems, foremost among, among which is the fact that he really was going blind. <laughs> um, so he, and he had, the reason he was wearing this eye patch is because he had just recently had a, an operation to, to make it better. Um, this, this number 12, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this number 12 here. So Sylvia, the, the most famous address of Shakespeare, of Sylvia Shakespeare and Company was number 12 Rue de la Odeon in Paris. And this is what it looks like today. I took this picture while I was in Paris and you'll see that there's nothing there now. It's, it just looks like an apart, like a, an apartment building, right? Although you can see there's another one of those plaques, it, and it says here that, at, you know, in the 20s and 30s, this was the location of Shakespeare and Company. And I actually really like the fact that there's nothing there now, because in 1941, she has to close the store um, because of the Nazi occupation of Paris, and she never really, really reopens. I um, mean, there's a great story associated with the closing that I'm not going to tell it's a little bit of a spoiler, so um, I'll let you read it in the book, but um, it's a great story. And, and I think it's fitting that there's no, actually nothing there today. Um, so we'll go back and, but this is, this is what it looked like. So this is a compare and contrast. So today, 1920s. And um, I keep forgetting to look up who these two lovely ladies were, but this is Sylvia and this is Ernest Hemingway with his head bandaged. <laughs> Um, and so this, so this is what um, her 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 um, shop at Rue de la Odeon would have looked like um, in the 1920s and 30s. So um, it's really, you know, what an amazing contrast, right? Um, and but this was not her first location. Her first, oh, and this is Sylvia and James Joyce again. And I believe that they are standing in this photo in the doorway of her original location, which was not at number 12, Rue de l'Odeon. It was at number eight, you can see here, Rue du Pitren in Paris, which is just around the corner, like a three minute walk, okay? And, and so she, where, when she opened in November of 1919, this is where she opened. And now, and this is what it is today. So Flora May is this cosmetics shop. And there's also on the other side, a, a salon. <laughs> um, and so, and in fact, I have heard, unfortunately, when I was there, Flora May was closed. But I have heard um, from, from other, other friends who have visited this location that the, the owner of Flora May is aware that originally the space was Shakespeare and Company. And he kind of, if you catch him on the right day, he can kind of explain where the bookshelves used to be and, and all this other cool stuff. So there's a real knowledge that this space, these spaces used to be Sylvia's very famous bookstore. And it, it was in this location for two years before it moved um, to its other most, more famous location. Now, um, the Shakespeare and Company that exists today is here. And um, one of my favorite podcasters took an advanced reader copy on her November trip to Shakespeare and Company and held my book up. So here it is. Here's my book at the current Shakespeare and Company in Paris, which is um, has been in this location since it first opened in 1951. So, and it was not Sylvia who opened the store. It was another enterprising book selling American named George Whitman um, who opened it. And he actually originally opened it under the name Le Mistral. And um, Sylvia was a regular at this store. She, she had closed her store down 10 years before and never reopened. And she came to shake this, this, this um, location. George Whitman rechristened the store Shakespeare and Company in 1964 um, uh, on the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth. And um, it's very, this store, and, and the store is now um, run by George's daughter, who he named Sylvia. So it's run by Sylvia Whitman. Um, and um, it is very, it has its own amazing history, which I really encourage you to find out more about. All you have to do is like go on their website, but it's also very much aware 
of its relationship and, and being a tribute kind of to Sylvia's original store. So if you go into the store, you will see um, various pictures and books and ephemera that relates to Sylvia's original store, even though this isn't the original store. But another another cool thing, I'll just go. So if you, it, 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 has, it has an adjacent cafe, um, which is, Sylvia really wanted to open a, a tea, what she called it a tea shop um, that would have been adjacent to her store, but it was a dream she never ha had a chance to realize. So it's really wonderful that this Shakespeare and Company has this cafe. And if you order your cafe creme, or the, it's a very, um, you know, it's French, but it also has like pressed juices and salads and things like that. So you can get that at, at Shakespeare and Company Cafe. Um, and you can sit, and this is the view from the cafe, okay? They are looking right at Notre Dame. And you can, I, so I took all these pictures. You can see Notre Dame had had the fire. Um, I don't remember exactly when the fire was, but you can see the scaffolding at the rear of the church. So you, no one could go to the church. I don't even know if it's open now. Um, but anyway, I, I just think it's such an amazing location. Um, it, you know, and it was, it was amazing to be there. Um, while the, the church was being rebuilt and, um, you know, it, it really, it was, it was terrific. So, so that's, that is, um, that is the story of the current Shakespeare and company. So now you all are in the know. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I learned so much just from that. Um, <laughs> so our owners of Schuler books, um, actually were in Paris when Notre Dame was burning. Um, and it was kind of terrifying because we didn't know why it was burning at the time. And right. I remember getting the news and um, yeah, they said it was a very emotional day and it was like very horrific. So I think that was early 2019. I wanna say. Yeah. I like it was right when I maybe had started. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Okay, more questions. Um, so the first one is from Carla Miller. Um, were there challenges writing the Paris bookseller? If so, what were they? Did you spend a lot of time in Shakespeare and Co. when you were in Paris? I didn't spend a ton of time in, in the current Shakespeare and Company. I definitely went in and like soaked it up and ordered something from the cafe and, and all of that stuff. Um, I actually spent more time kind of haunting those other two locations because I really wanted to feel like I was there and, and I understood that neighborhood because that was where my book was going to be set. Um, and you know, that kind of, you know, that gets to the heart of the answer to your other question, which was what were the challenges? You know, this was a book that I literally could have spent the rest of my life researching and never writing. <laughs> so I really, because it, it's about writers um, who left behind their own lifetime of writing, plus their famous writers. So many books and articles have been written about them you know, in the last hundred years. So I had to make some real choices about what I was going to focus on in my research. And, you know, one of my leading lights, my North stars was the fact that the book was from Sylvia's point of view. It's in close third person. So that helped me narrow my research down. But, you know, of course I wanted to feel like when I wrote dialogue, you know, that's not necessarily from Sylvia's point of view. That's, you know, if I'm putting words in Ernest Hemingway's mouth, it needs to sound like Ernest Hemingway on some level, right? He needs to be recognizable <laughs> to readers. So, but, but that was largely a fun process. You know, I went and, and, you know, revisited, like I said, some of the things that I had read in the past and, um, read some things that I, I hadn't read before. Um, so, but that was, that was a real challenge was sort of deciding when to stop reading and start writing. And I have this kind of, a little bit of this intuitive woo woo process inside, which is, you know, I'm doing all this research and suddenly scenes just start appearing to me. <laughs> and I start, and like, instead of taking notes in my computer, I'm writing dialogue. And that's usually my cue that it's time to start at least drafting the book, which it doesn't mean that the research is over, but it, it means that I'm, I'm ready to start kind of putting things in motion. That you have enough, enough mm -hmm. to get started. That you have enough to get started. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we have a question from Elizabeth Howard. Um, what percentage of your book would you say is true to Sylvia's life versus fictionalized portions? Oh, 
gosh, this is always such a hard question. And it's one that I, I answer in more detail in my author's note um, to this book. But again, because of the sheer amount of research I could have done, um, I, I just, I had, I had to decide that I was going to make up a significant amount of material. Now, let me qualify that. All the dates are correct, except one date. <laughs> like made major the major dates are correct. The, so all the dates, the um when you know when Sylvia opened the store and closed the store and and when when, when the trial of Ulysses and and all of those major historic dates are correct. Um, but like I could not go back and figure out exactly when certain people like Ezra Pound or T.S. Eliot were, if they were definitely in Paris in March, like of 1926. I just did not do that. If they were, if I knew that they were in Paris in that year, that was kind of good enough for me. And as a result, I did bring Ernest Hemingway. And I, this is something that I actually do put in my author's note because there are so many Ernest Hemingway really aficionados out there. I bring Hemingway on the scene six months before he actually got there. <laughs> and, but, you know, I made that, I, that was an actual decision that I made to kind of move the story along and heighten the narrative tension. Like I did it on purpose. It was, it was conscious. So that's kind of an example of a place where I felt like I could um, take a small liberty. Um, but, but especially because I was, I was trying to be true to the major dates, right? Um, Elizabeth also would like to know, are there any family members of Sylvia's remaining who you were able to speak with about her life when doing your research? You know, I did not do that. Sylvia, Sylvia um, never, never married. She, she, um, and never had children of her own. Um, I, she did have um, a nephew um, who I believe does have children. Um, but she, you know, her, she had two sisters, um, one of whom had an adopted son and they, but they, she was not close with them um, in her adult life, really. They stayed in America um, and she stayed in Paris and she did visit and she did, they, there were lots of letters exchanged, but I'm not sure she really knew um, the extended family as well as she, she might have um, if she had gone back to the States. Um, uh, she actually, her, her lifelong relationship was with, we haven't, it's funny, we haven't talked about this. It's an important part of the story was with Adrienne Monnier, who opened, who um, owned a bookstore and lending library called La Maison des Amis de Livre, the house of the friends of books, um, and she, which she opened in 1915 and was really the inspiration for Sylvia's store. Um, and they were a couple for all of the 20s and most of the 30s. Um, and, you know, that's an important piece of the book, and I won't talk more about that. I hope you'll, you know, um, read the book. But um, so, so they, they did not have children. <laughs> Um, we have one question um, regarding your writing style. Um, how do you write your book? Do you use an outline? Oh, so <laughs> um, before I started writing historical fiction, when I wrote other kinds of novels, which are not published, <laughs> um, I was what's known as a pantser which was a writing by the seat of my pants kind of writer. I thought outlines, that's no fun. Um, but historical fiction made me a plotter. So like that's a, an often a question like that writers talk about, like, are you a pantser or are you a plotter? So historical fiction really made me into a plotter because I had to do all this research and take notes for myself. And the form that those notes so far at least take for me is there's this big Microsoft Word document, which I divide by year or by month and it's chronological. And as I'm kind of doing my research, I'm filling in major events and ideas um, that happen uh, you know, over, over time. And I don't usually create a separate, more, um, uh, more focused outline from that, but what I do, because it's already kind of subdivided, um, I kind of see the shape of the novel from that, we'll call it a menu. It's almost like a menu of events. And so I, and I know what are the major events. Like I knew I was obviously going to have a scene 
on February 2nd of 1922, when she first holds Ulysses in her hands, like, how could I not have that scene? Um, so I know that certain scenes are going to happen. And then a lot of the kind of fiction and imagination comes in the question of, okay, well, so I know that this is going to happen in 1919, and this is going to happen in 1921. What, what, journey does Sylvia need to go on to get her from this decision to that decision, you know? And so that's, that's where a lot of the fiction of historical fiction comes in. Well, Carrie, um, what do you, how, how do people find out what's next for you? How do they follow you? They follow me on Instagram. <laughs> um, Perfect. And I, I do have a website. The website is carrymare.com. And my Instagram and Facebook and now TikTok, I'm, <gasps> I'm, I'm giving it a try, are you all should. are the same. Are you on TikTok? Um, I'm personally not. Um, <laughs> however, our store just hit over a hundred thousand followers. We've gone viral multiple times. We have the most amazing couple of people working on that platform. So oh, you should well, definitely be on TikTok. <laughs> I hope that they do something for our event and then tag me. <laughs> I will make sure they do. I don't know how you reach. I'm so new. Like, I don't know if there's a way to reshare, you know, like anyway. So, but all, so I am at Carrie Mayer writer on Instagram, Facebook, and, um, and TikTok. I am most active at the moment on Instagram. I am, I am on Twitter as Carrie Mayer books. Um, and, but I am not as active on Twitter. Let's just say that Instagram is sort of where I'm most comfortable Instagram. and I'm on there very consistently. Yeah. That's where it's at Instagram for sure. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat for all of you wonderful viewers. Um, this is the link to go and purchase um, a copy of the Paris bookseller. If you haven't done so already, um, we are shipping constantly. So feel free to go and check out that link. Carrie, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight and all of our wonderful viewers. Thank you so much for having me. And I just want to point out that the, the books are signed. I have, I sent book plates. So they are signed, yeah. signed books that you will be buying from Schuler Books. Um, so I, thank you so much for having me and for, and for doing the book plates and, and for really honestly doing everything you've done during the pandemic to, for readers and writers to bring us together. It is, I mean, I've just written this book about running an independent bookstore. Running an independent bookstore is no joke. Um, and so thank you so much for everything you do. Oh, absolutely. All right, everyone have a wonderful night. I'm going to clap for you because you can't hear everybody else. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.